the President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to David Rockefeller and Ambassador George Landau and Robert Helander and all of you. Welcome to the White House Complex. I think they call this the White House Complex because nothing in Washington could ever be simple, <laughs> except maybe Congress's compulsion to spend. <laughs> and it's a, it is a pleasure to have you, the members of the Council of Americas, here today. In 1933, Franklin Roosevelt said, common ideals and a community of interest, together with a spirit of cooperation, have led to a realization that the well-being of one nation depends in large measure upon the well-being of its neighbors. It is upon these foundations, he said, that Pan-Americanism has been built. Well, FDR could easily have been speaking for you. For nearly 30 years, the Council of the Americas has promoted understanding and cooperation between the United States and the nations and peoples of Latin America. The Council has brought leaders to our private sector together with business and government leaders throughout Latin America. It's helped strengthen the old and enduring friendship between the United States and Latin America. It's been helping to make our nation's great engine of hope and opportunity, the private enterprise system, the engine of hope and opportunity for Latin America as well. And let me just say that the entire hemisphere owes its gratitude to the Council, and in particular to your chairman, one of the great citizens of the Americas, David Rockefeller. You know, when some people talk, they make it sound as though development is some kind of a magic process, not the hard work of real men and women. It reminds me of a story a lot of things remind me of stories these days. <laughs> and if I've told you all this one before, just forget it and pretend I didn't. It comes in handy every once in a while, this particular one. It's about an old fellow that lived down by the creek, and he had some creek bottom land, and he went to work on it one day. It was all brush covered and rocks, everything there, and he worked, and he got rid of the brush, and then he hauled the rocks away, and he cultivated, and he fertilized, and planted, and finally he had a real garden spot there. And one Sunday morning after church, he asked the minister, why didn't he, after lunch, come on out and see what he'd accomplished? Well, the minister came out that afternoon, and he took him down there, and the minister said, I've never seen call so, or corn so tall. He said, my goodness, the Lord has blessed this land. And then he went on, he said, melons. He said, look, praise the Lord. Look at the size of those melons. And he went on about everything else and all of that and praising the Lord. And the old boy was getting pretty restive. And finally, he said, Reverend, I wish you could have seen this place when the Lord was doing it by himself. <laughs> well, today, two great winds are sweeping across Latin America, the wind of free enterprise and the wind of democracy. They are warm and nurturing winds that carry with them the gentle rains of hope for Latin America's future. Country after country has seen the disaster of state-controlled and dominated economies. In both small and large steps, nations are beginning on the difficult path away from statism and toward freer economies. As Brazilian President Jose Sarnes said recently, private initiative is the engine of economic development. In Brazil, we have learned that every time the state's penetration of the economy increases, our liberty decreases. I want to diminish the state's presence. Well, from one end of Latin America to the other, the message of reform is on everyone's lips. And despite problems, progress is being made. In the South, Argentina, for example, has reformed its tax code, liberalized trade, and moved to privatize and reform publicly owned companies. Between 1984 and 86, 
it reduced its budget deficit from over 12 percent of gross do domestic product to 4 percent. It has cut inflation dramatically, and once again the economy is growing, not sluggishly, but at a robust 5.5 percent last year. Meanwhile, on the American border, Mexico has also reduced the number of parastatal companies and is moving toward tax reform and more market-oriented pricing and has begun to make trade more open. Debt remains a burden for too many countries, but the final and best way to lighten that burden is not by jeopardizing access to the international financial markets, but with freer trade, sounder monetary and fiscal policies, and greater economic growth. To take one example, Colombia is following this path and last year was able to make its first voluntary euro financing since 1982. And other nations have eased their debt loads with de debt equity swaps. All the countries of Latin America need to rely less on borrowing by one course or another and more on investment from abroad. The United States is determined to help the countries of Latin America grow as a young tree grows toward the sun pushing the boulder of debt out of the way as they do. We've encouraged continuing private lending. We're encouraging Latin American leaders to trust more in the energies of their people and less on government. Just as important, we've provided the market that Latin America needs if it is to pay off its foreign debt. We buy nearly half of Latin America's exports, while Europe and Japan together buy less than 10%. If our trade balance with Latin America had been the same over the last five years as it was in 1981, our overall trade deficit would have averaged $25 billion less a year. Put another way, one quarter of the trade deficit during our administration came about as a result of the debt crisis. We're convinced that if Latin America commits itself to sound policies for economic growth, it's going to bounce back. Then our sales to them will rebound as well, which will be good for everyone. So you see, this is an investment in the future of our entire hemisphere, an investment in our future as well as Latin America's. That's the best investment the United States can make. But if the economic growth of the next century in Latin America is to be as powerful and relentless as the Amazon, then democracy in that vast region must become as towering as the Andes. Just as the Amazon rises in those magnificent mountains, so too does the river of opportunity rise in the highlands of freedom. Today it's possible for the first time in our history to see approaching the moment when the entire Western Hemisphere, from the Canadian Arctic to Tierra del Fuego, is composed of democracies. As the Peruvian novelist Mario Vargas Llosa said recently, for the first time, democracy or incipient democratic forms of government are being established in the countries of our hemisphere with clear popular support and with equally clear rejection of Marxist revolution or military dictatorship. Today, anti-democratic alternatives are running against the will of the people supported only by economic and intellectual elites. You know, there's a thundering sound that echoes from the peaks and across the plains of Latin America. It's the sound of people marching, not in uniforms, not behind red banners, but rather marching one by one in simple, everyday working clothes, marching to the poles. Ten years ago, 33% of the people of Latin America and the Caribbean lived in democracies or in countries that were turning to democracy. Today over 90 percent do. Several of these new democracies have faced crises in the past few years. But unlike earlier times, every crisis has ended with democracy's forces still in control. Only a few countries resist the democratic tide, and among these the most dangerous are Cuba and Nicaragua. As President Kennedy told us more than a quarter century ago, in his words, the forces of communism are not to be underestimated in Cuba or anywhere else in the world. The advantages of a police state, its use of mass terror and arrest to prevent the spread of free dissent cannot be overlooked by those who expect the fall of every fanatical tyrant. If the self-discipline of the free cannot match the iron discipline of the mailed fist, then the peril to freedom will continue to rise.
we must remember that in Nicaragua the freedom fighters fight is our fight. Our goal is democracy in Nicaragua and throughout the hemisphere. In the 19th century, Europe emerged as the first great industrial continent of the earth. In the 20th century, North America joined it. In the 21st century, Latin America will also enter that company. For the sake of our own peace and freedom, it must be a democratic region when it does, or as the Argentine poet Jose Hernandez wrote more than a century ago, the Americas have a great destiny to achieve in the fate of mankind. An American alliance will undoubtedly be achieved and the American alliance will bring world peace. The Americas must be the cradle of the great principles which will bring a complete change in the political and social organization of other nations. So to all of us and all of you who are helping build the future of, the, of this hem hemisphere of hope, I thank you for what you're doing. I can't resist this comparison. We all have the common heritage from the Arctic down there to that southern tip and the pioneer heritage. And to those of us that turn to freedom as the basis for all that we did, we can see what has resulted. Just those others that still have yielded to statism. I have become a collector of stories that I can prove are told by the Soviet people among themselves, showing a certain growing cynicism about their heritage. And this last one had to do with a young man buying an automobile. It's not an exaggeration. It takes 10 years to get delivery in the Soviet Union. But you have to pay for the automobile right at the first, not when you get it. So this young fellow was going from agency to agency and getting permits here and permits there and stamps he was collecting. And finally, at the final place and the final stamp was put on. And then he laid out the cash. And the man said, come back in 10 years and get your car. And the young fellow started to turn away. And he turned back. And he says, morning or afternoon? <laughs> and the fellow behind the counter said, what difference does it make? Well, he said, the plumber's coming in the morning. <laughs> Thank you all, and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for what was really a very inspiring and I think most significant speech. It's a great privilege for all of us to be able to welcome you here again to the Washington Conference of the Council on, uh, of the Americas and also uh, to the Americas Society, which the Council is an affiliate. We're particularly grateful to you also, Mr. President, for having participated in four of these conferences since you've been in office. And more importantly, you have demonstrated through your presidency that you were an ardent champion of freedom and democracy through the uh, nations of this hemisphere. As you yourself pointed out, today over 90% of the people of our hemisphere live in countries where democracy uh, reigns, uh, reigns uh, at this present time. But I would have to add to that that you have never swerved for a moment in your effort to make sure that the figure is 100%. Countries such as Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, and Haiti have to take satisfaction in the active moral support that you gave them in their successful struggles to regain the cherished blessings of freedom and of pluralistic society. You've also been a champion of the virtues of the market economy and a strong private sector as a means of promoting growth in this hemisphere. And this, too, has given courage to nations struggling to rid themselves of the crushing debt burden, which have come to see that the inward-looking government-dominated uh, economies, which they had encouraged in the past, were not producing the desired result. Many of them are now promoting greater export orientation with far more private sector participation. 
Mr. President, for these and many other reasons, the Pan American Society, which is also an affiliate of the Americas Society, has designated you to be the recipient of our highest recognition, the gold insignia. With your permission, I'd like to say just a few words about its uh, origin and history. Founded in 1912, the Pan American Society has uh, dedicated uh, to fostering better relations among the hemisphere uh, nations. It's become a tradition to encourage this objective by awarding the society's gold insignia to outstanding leaders of the democratic nations of our hemisphere. As we celebrate our 75th anniversary this year, we're delighted that the President of the United States is being so honored. The first gold insignia was given in 1932 when the Pan American Society celebrated its 20th anniversary. Numerous heads of state from the Americas have been recognized with it since that time. Needless to say, we're deeply honored that you could spare the time to be with us today, Mr. President, and we're pleased that you will join the list of distinguished leaders of this hemisphere in accepting the gold insignia. Since you were sworn into office, for example, Mr. President, 14 democratically elected Latin American heads of state have honored us by accepting this award, including, among others, such distinguished people as President Duarte of El Salvador, President Sarne of Brazil, President Alfonsín of Argentina, President Lucinci of Venezuela, President Febres Cordero of Ecuador, and President de la Madrid of Mexico. Among the U.S. presidents who have been honored over the years include Presidents Hoover, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. Your accepting the gold insignia today reestablishes an important link between the Pan American Society and the White House, for which we, of course, are especially grateful. So at this time, Mr. President, may I ask uh, you and uh, our president, Ambassador George Landau, and the vice chairman of the Pan American Society, Mr. Robert Helander, to come forward to join me in presenting this award to you. All the colors of the hemisphere flag. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you very you much. I'm grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes